Hello everyone. I am here at the Woodland Cemetery and Arbitorium in Dayton, Ohio, for the burial site of, well, a few people. Mainly, this Dayton is known as the birthplace of aviation uh, because here in this very cemetery, we have the graves of Wilbur Wright and Orville Wright, the two Wright brothers, the two men who invented the airplane and uh, launched their first successful flight in 1903. They are both buried here, they're from Dayton, Ohio. Uh, this cemetery was first laid out in 1841. Again, just like um, a bunch of cemeteries around here during a movement in the United States to get away from small church cemeteries into these pitch, picturesque grounds, just like Spring Grove Cemetery and Hollywood Cemetery we've done before. This is part of that movement as well. So here are the two Wright brothers, Wilbur Wright, uh, 1867 to 1912, and Orville Wright, 1871 to 1948. We'll get more into them once we check out their graves, but for now, uh, the Wrights rest at Woodland. Here's a picture of their burial site in, um, I don't know when this was taken, but uh, here at Woodland rest or Wilbur and Orville Wright and many others who contributed to much of Dayton and America. Not too far from the modest headstone of the, invent of the inventors of the airplane is the grave of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, prominent early 20th century African-American poet and author. I've never heard of him before. Dunbar was the highest school classmate of Orville Wright, so they both went to school together. And then here are them. This is the map where they're at, and there's Dunbar here. All right, let's go check out this historical marker. It was founded in 1841. Woodland is one of the most, one of the nation's oldest rural garden cemeteries, the style of which was a dramatic departure from traditional church burial grounds at the time, which is what I just talked about. Woodland's oldest portion, including Victorian era burial sections, a Roman-esque gateway, and a Tiffany Chapel, forms a district li listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Arbitorium, which over 3,000 trees on more than 200 acres, completes this outdoor museum of Dayton history. Among those buried here are this, our cemetery founder, John Van Cleve. The Wright brothers, inventors John Patterson and Charles Kettering, poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Colonel Edward Deeds, Governor James Cox, and humorist Irma Bombeck. So I don't think we'll be able to check out all of their graves, but there's a few more that aren't listed here that I'm going to check out. Um, these are kind of just the five or six that I chose beforehand to go check out. But uh, just that these are some of the most prominent people here. There are other famous graves here that we're going to check out that aren't listed here, but we're going to see a few of these. Here are all the famous people buried here. People of note buried here. Um, here are some of the ones we're going to... So there's... Uh, I'm not going to say all their names, but here they are listed in alphabetical order from David Albritton all the way to Major David Ziegler. Now, Ziegler, we're actually going to check out his grave because he's pretty cool. He's one of the oldest famous graves. He was a part of the... He was an officer in the American Revolution. It's a very beautiful area. I think an, arb an arbitorium is like a tree thing. Some, something to do with trees. So like it said, I had thousands of trees planted here. All right, let's get, all right, let's get into the first famous grave. All right, we are here at the burial site of James Middleton Cox. Now, a lot of you guys probably have not heard of him, but he played a major role in Ohio and United States politics. So, Cox, right here. Uh, was born in 1870. This is his. This is his grave right here, James Middleton Cox. He got his whole family here. This is his main headstone. So Cox was born in um, 1870. Uh, he was from Dayton, uh, and then he became the. He served in the House of Representatives from 1909 to 1913, and he resigned uh, because. He was offered to run for Ohio governor, and he in the House to run for governor, and he became the 47th governor of Ohio, serving uh, from 1913 to 1915. But in 1914, he lost his seat. He lost re-election. Uh, so, but he came back in 1917. He won the election in 1916 and served until 1920. In 1920, he was offered. He ran. He decided to run for president. And he won the Democratic nomination in 1920 and ran against Warren Harding. And guess who was his running mate? None other than 38-year-old Franklin Roosevelt was actually his running mate in 1920. So in 1920, the election, you had two Ohio 
uh, two Ohio candidates, Warren Harding from Marion, Ohio, and then um, Cox from uh, Dayton. So there was both of them. He did sadly lose in 1920. And 1920 was obviously the first election that women could vote in. Um, so he was there, but he, he sadly lost there. And then he made it, uh, and he died in 1957 in Dayton. So here's his grave. Not too much to see here. Let's check out some of these other graves just for a little bit before we get to the next famous hero site. This is um, Herman Bader. I don't know these. these I, not all these are famous graves, but. picturesque cemeteries a lot of the graves have very fancy designs not your usual headstones a lot of them have monuments for the family and then they have the headstones at the bottom for where they're actually buried uh, for example uh, you had Cox's grave he was the main he's the main selling point for that family and they have all his family down here James Cox Jr. 1903 to 1974 and then Margar uh, Margarita Blair Cox running mate was in that election. A lot of people didn't, didn't don't know that that Franklin Roosevelt actually could have became vice president if he won, but he was governor. He served as governor of Ohio twice. That was probably his biggest achievement. He was the 47th and 49th governor. There's also a quarter and a penny and a quarter and a penny. Thomas Blair Cox, 1918 and 1918, probably an infant child. Uh, and Eliza Cox, 1835 to 1915, and then Helen Cox, Mahoney, 1896 to 1921. That's not old either. That's like, that's like only 25. Uh, here's so here's Polk. I wonder if they're related to James Polk. Probably not, but there we go. Just just some random people buried here. All right. Just this place is beautiful. Okay, I, I recommend this all the time. I count. If you're in Dayton, Ohio, I highly recommend you check out this place. We actually just checked out the Air Force Museum. So if you come to Dayton and you're into history, check out this place and the United States National Air Force Museum or whatever it's called. Oh, here's William Cox, 1853 to 1941. He, I wonder, that couldn't have been his father. Probably not. He won't only have been 17. I don't know. That might be his older brother or something. Somehow he's related. That's Cox. I, I like Cox. He's one of my favorite presidential candidates. He actually knew what he was doing. He was a very qualified person for the office. And I think could have been a decent president if he had won. He's one of the few presidential candidates that um, I think would have actually done a really good job. And I think he probably should have won over Harding. I like Warren Harding too, but I probably would have voted for Cox. Just saying. All right. Next grave is arguably, probably the most famous person or people buried in this cemetery. Actually, probably some of the most famous people buried in Ohio. The Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright. So they're buried back here in this section. This section's kind of compacted. This is crazy, this is crazy. So obviously, if you're not already aware, the Wright brothers were the two people two brothers that invented the first airplane in 1903 was when they first flew it in north carolina they're from dayton ohio that's why they're buried here uh wilbur and orville were their names and funny enough in animal crossing new horizons the dodo airlines that they have in the game the one you use to go to other people's islands the two dodo birds are orville and wilbur named after the wright brothers orville is the one in the desk uh, in, the, in the airport on your island and then Wilbur's the one that's at the deserted island that flies the plane They're named after the Wright brothers. They're pretty famous if some Japanese video game developer knows about them But here's their grave. That's that's a This design looks really familiar. There's a lot of a lot of famous people have this design in their grave. So, um, or, uh, Wilbur Wright, we'll start with him. I don't, I don't know who these people are. These might be like their, um, Milton Wright, and those are just fan members, but these are the main ones here. Okay. So, here's Wilbur Wright. Wilbur Wright was born in 1867. He was actually born in Indiana. He was not born in Dayton. Um, and he was there in 1903 when they flew the first airplane with his brother Orville. 
he actually ended up dying in 1912. He actually sadly got typhoid fever and died when he was 45, just nine years after that. Uh, the first plane was flown. And then Orville, who was the younger of the two, he was born in 1871. Wilbur's the guy with the awesome mustache. I love Orville. Orville, right? I like Wilbur and Orville. I love how they named in Animal Crossing, they named them the dodos after them. That's so cool. So here's Orville Wright. He actually made it to 1948, dying age 75, um, in um, or whatever age that would be, 76, actually, 76. And he was born in Dayton. Look at all these pennies people have left on here. Let's see what the oldest one is. That's not an nice. Anyway, so there's Orville and Wilbur Wright. So these two are the first two people to fly, fly the airplane in 1903. Very revolutionary inventors. Almost everybody has heard of them. It's so crazy that they're buried right here because I've, I've grown up my whole life learning about them and knowing that the freaking bodies right here is just insane. Freaking Wright brothers are buried right there. Can you believe that? All right, let's go take a 360 view. Near here, they said that uh, that uh, poet at the beginning is buried here. So here's Orville and Wilbur Wright. This is, um, what does that say? Catherine, uh, Catherine Wright Haskell, 1874 to 1929. I think that was probably um, maybe their wife or something. Uh, it was probably, or I don't think Wilbur actually got married. I think Orville did that. And there's one of the older graves. I guess I was probably put there before. But here's the main monument. Are these free to take? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Here's a little pamphlet about them. We'll read this here. We might as well. This is nice. More graves should do this. Like, because if people come here and don't know anything about them, it's good. Dedicated to Wilbur and Orville Wright and the Centennial of Flight. So here's a picture of them. This is Wilbur. This is Orville. And then here's some, oh, these are just all remembering the Wright family. And this is just a bunch of famous people buried here at Woodland. Oh, let's get back here. Oh, gosh, man. 1882 to 1888, 1887, 1888. That's not good. It looks way better in the summer with the um, with the grass here. Uh, when you come in the winter, everything's all dead and stuff. Here comes a tractor. Anyway, let's read this a little bit of this. I might read the whole thing. I don't know. Probably not the whole thing, but here we go. I'm not going to read this whole thing. But here we go. Here's a picture. This is Catherine Wright. 1874 to 1929. She was born exactly three years after Orville Wright. The only surviving girl of Milton Wright and Susan Corner. So that was actually their sister. Never mind. Sorry about that, Orville. She was especially close to Wilbur and Orville. Uh, or is it, is it Orville? It might be Orville. Orville or Orville. I don't know. I always said Orville. And when I was playing Animal Crossing, I always called him Orville. So... Uh, and when their mother died in 1889, she took over the responsibility for the household. Catherine uh, graduated from Oberlin College in 1898. Uh, she took, uh, then took a position at the Steele High School in Dayton, Ohio, to help with the household chores. She hired a maid, Carrie uh, Kaler, who remained with the family for decades. Wilbur asked Catherine to go to France with Orville. Um, and in 1909, they joined him in Powell. She quickly dominated the social scene, being far more outgoing and charming uh, than the notoriously shy brothers. French newspapers were fascinated by what they saw as the human side, we film that too, uh, as the human side of the rights. Rumors began to circulate as Catherine's importance in the invention uh, of the Wright Flyer. Some myths, such as her funding of the experiments or sewing wing coverings or to help with math needed to design the airplane, lived on despite strenuous dint by the brothers at the time. Uh, when they returned to Dayton, Ohio, all three siblings uh, were huge celebrities, and Catherine took on business responsibilities, becoming an officer of the Wright Company in 1912 after Wilbur died. Uh, the company was sold in 1915 by Orville. Orville sold the Wright Company in 1915. In 1917, their father Milton died. Three years after he, after he, Catherine Orville, and Charles and Carrie Kaler 
moved to Hawthorne Hill, a newly constructed mansion in, in the Dayton suburb of Oakwood. Orville became increasingly dependent on Catherine. She looked after his social s schedule, uh, corresponding and business engagements, along with his secretary, Mabel Beck, and ran the household as before. In the 1920s, Catherine re renewed correspondence with an old boyfriend from college days, newspaperman H Henry Haskell, uh, a widower who lived in Kansas City. They began a romance through their letters, but Catherine feared Orville's reaction. After several attempts, Henry broke the news to Orville. He was devastated and stopped speaking to his sister. Catherine uh, wed in 1926. Orville refused to attend the ceremony. Catherine and her husband moved to Kansas City, but she grieved over her broken relationship with Orville. She tried many times for a re re recon reconciliation, but Orville refused, refused. Two years after her marriage, Catherine contracted pneumonia. Uh, when Orville found out, he still refused to contact her. Their brother, L Lauren, uh, persuaded him to visit her, and he was at her bedside when she died in 1929. So that's a little bit about her. Now here's, here's a little about the Wright brothers themselves, though. This will be the last thing I read here, and then we'll get going. Sorry about that. Uh, Wilbur was a bright and studious child and excelled in school. His personality was outgoing and robust. Uh, he, he made plans to attend Yale University after high school. In the winter of 1885 to 1886, an accident changed uh, the course of Wilbur's life. He was badly injured in an ice hockey game when another player's stick hit him in the face. Uh, through, through most of his injuries uh, healed, the, act, the incident plunged Wilbur into a depression. He did not receive his high school diploma, canceled plans for college, and retreated to his family's home. Wilbur spent much of this period at home reading books in his family's library and caring for his ailing mother. In 1889, the brothers started their own newspaper, The West Side News. Wilbur edited the paper and Orville was the publisher. The brothers also shared a passion for bicycles, a new craze that was sweeping the country. And in 1892, Wilbur and Orville opened a bike shop, fixing bicycles and selling their own design. Always working on different mechanical projects and keeping up with the scientific research, the Wright brothers closely followed uh, the research of German aviator Otto Lilenthal. When Lilenthal died in a glider crash, the brothers decided to start their own experiments with flight. Wilbur and Orville set to work trying to figure out how to design wings for a flight. Uh, they observed that birds angle their wings for balance and control and try to emulate this, developing a concept called wing warping. When they added a movable rubber, they, the Wright brothers found that they had the magic formula. On December, 7th, 1903, on December 17th, 1903, they succeeded in flying the first free controlled flight of a power-driven plane. Wilbur, Wilbur, there, Wilbur flew the plane 50, for 59 seconds at 852 feet, an extraordinary achievement. He had the plane in the air for about a minute, which was uh, more than any time in that history. They were the first person to fly the plane. So Wilbur was the one that flew it. Wilbur and Orville always shared credit for their innovations and maintained a close relationship throughout their lives. Behind the scenes, however, there was a division of labor. With his sharp instincts, Wilbur was the business mind and executive of the operating the operation, serving as president of the Wright Company. What began with the design and flight of kites soon moved into gliders and then more elaborate aircraft inventions. Relying mostly on trial and error, the Wright brothers eventually designed a powered airplane with a 12 horsepower engine. After their successful flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, which is an area chosen, which is an area chosen based uh, on its weather patterns, that's why they chose to fly there. Orville and Wilbur Wright went on to develop their invention into the first practical airplane. They obtained a patent in 1906, starting their own business, the Wright Company, and began building and selling mo mo more sophisticated airplanes. The Wright brothers' invention is so technically and culturally significant that the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. keeps the Wright Flyer on permanent display. We didn't visit that when we went to Washington, D.C., so they have the exact planes still there in a, in a museum. 
Wilbur fell ill on a trip to Boston in April of 1912. He was diagnosed with typhoid fever and died on the 30th of May. At his family home in Dayton, Ohio, Milton Wright wrote in his diary, a short life full of consequences and unfailing intellect. Eventually, he was the one that flew that plane originally. And then Orville obviously was there with him, both of them. Cool. Uh, it, really not much else to say. I mean, I think you, you got the whole story about the Wright brothers. If you didn't already know about them, I'm sure you've probably heard of the Wright brothers. No matter how much into history you are, everybody has heard of the Wright brothers. And it's, it's amazing to be at their grave right now. These are some of the most revolutionary people in human history, to be honest with you. Um, probably one of the most famous graves in Ohio. This is probably more famous than some of the president graves, if I'm really being honest. Don't you agree, cameraman? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, that's a little bit about Orville River, right? We'll go check out the poet's grave back here. We kind of got to look for it. This is Paul Lawrence Dunbar. This is the uh, African-American poet. We'll read about him. I'm not too big into poet poetry stuff, but just because I'm not interested in it doesn't mean you guys aren't. And this guy was obviously very revolutionary. This is Paul Lawrence Dunbar, 1872 to 1906. Lay me down beneath the wilders in the grass. Wah, they branch go singing as it pass. And when is laying low, I, I can't read. It's it's a it's it's probably a line from one of his poems. So this is so cool. I wish other cemeteries did this. Obviously, full rights to Woodland Cemetery. I'm not. Um, I didn't come up with any of these myself. These are all cemetery, which you probably already know. This is really cool. I'm just gonna say right now. I think more cemeteries should do stuff like this because. People come by and they could see a grave of a really famous person and not even know it. And you can see with these that, because I don't know, I don't know anything about Dunbar, so we're gonna learn together. Sorry if this reading stuff is boring to you, but um, you know, that's just how it is. You gotta learn about this, you gotta honor these guys' lives. So this is the Paul Lawrence Dunbar story. Uh, he was born in 1872. We'll get this out here. So Paul Lawrence Dunbar was the first, here's what he's known for. He was the first African American poet to garner national critical prominence. He authored a large body of dialect poems, standard English poems, essays, novels, operas, and short stories before he died at the age of 33. Didn't live long at all. His work often addressed the difficulties encountered by members of his race and the efforts of African Americans to achieve equalities in America. Dun Dunbar was praised both by the prominent literary uh, critics of his time and his literary contemporaries. He was, he was invited to give readings of his work for the courts of Queen Victoria in London and beyond. That's pretty cool, Queen Victoria, I freaking love her. It was Dunbar's second book, Majors and Minors, that propelled him to national fame. His no notoriety resulted in his inclusion in President McKinley's processional to attend the inauguration. So he was at uh, William McKinley's inauguration in 19, either in 1890, uh, well, I guess it would have been, it could have been one of them. It was either 1897 or 1901, depending on which term it was. But one of those uh, Dunbar was born on June 27th, 1872 to Matilda and Joshua Dunbar, buried near Paul's grave in Woodland. Uh, Matilda, his mom, is buried somewhere. It says very near. Oh, uh, this is, I don't know where she's at specifically in here. Um, there, and then his father, jo Joshua Dunbar, is buried at the Dayton's National Veterans Cemetery. Both natives of Kentucky, his mother was a former slave, and his father had escaped from slavery uh, and served in the 55th Massachusetts Infantry uh, Regiment in the 5th Massachusetts Colored Cavalry during the Civil War. Matilda and Joshua had two children in total. Dunbar's sister Elizabeth, who died at the age of two, is buried at Woodward. Here she is right here, um, or Woodland, uh, as you can see, 1873 to 1876. Dunbar's early life. Matilda, her, his mother, supported her children by working in Dayton as a housekeeper. One of the families she worked for was the family of Orville and Wilbur Wright. What do you know, man? What do you know? It's kind of cool. We just saw their grave. Um, 
whom her son attended the Dayton Central High School. So uh, he, this guy went to school with um, Orville and Wilbur. Right. Uh, they, um, although the Dunbar family had little material wealth, Matilda taught her children a love songs and storytelling. Having heard poems read by the family as she worked for them when she was a slave, Matilda loved poetry and encouraged her children to read. Dunbar was inspired by his mother, and he had begun, began reciting and writing poetry as early as the age of six. Dunbar was the only African American in his class at Dayton Central High School and graduated as valedictorian, which means he's the number one in his class. Um, and he was the only African-American there. In one of Dunbar's personal journals, he wrote that he was well accepted by his classmates. He published an African-American newsletter in Dayton, the Dayton Tatler, uh, with the help from the Wright brothers. So Dayton, um, this guy being African-American, and so he was born in the 1870s, he probably graduated high school in the 1890s. So for being an African-American in the 1890s, and being well accepted in your school is very rare. He must have been a very likable person. There's a lot of people back then were they were not supportive of that. Although we are in um, Ohio, even though we're in Ohio, that does not mean there was not racism. But there was not as much as like you know we're in deep South states. But uh, Dunbar's literary legacy. Dunbar was a prolific writer, ultimately producing 12 books of poetry, four books of short stories a play and five novels. His work appeared in Harper's Weekly, The Sunday Evening Post, The Denver Post, uh, and Current Literature, and a number of other magazines and journals. Depression from his declining health due to his tuberculosis drove Dunbar to a, a dependence on alcohol, a dependence on alcohol, which further damaged his health. He died in Dayton, uh, in the Dayton home that he had purchased for his mother on the 9th of February, 1906. Dunbar's body was held um, in the receiving vault until spring and was initially interred at Woodland Cemetery in a section near Wyoming Street. Several communities, community leaders, including Orville Wright, made arrangements for Paul to be buried in Section 101, not too far from the Wright brothers' family plot. In 1909, he was reinterred in Section 101, which is where he is today. Uh, he was reinterred in Section 101, uh, arrangements having been made by the Paul Lawrence Dunbar Memorial Association. On his birthday that year, which was in 1909, so um, in 1909, on his birthday, a memorial consisting of a boulder with a simple bronze plaque crafted by Tiffany. The plaque, which rests next to a willow tree in honor of Dunbar, contains first stanza of a death song, which was, here's the thing that he wrote um the willow the willow tree apparently this this tree here uh, had some sort of significance to one of his poems i guess the willow tree appeared in that poem that's why he's buried under the tree there pretty cool story with dunbar I have not heard of him but very interesting person so uh him and him and wilbur wright both had very Great lives with a bunch of accomplishments, but their health was not, their mental and physical health kind of declined them to die at a young age, but they did accomplish a lot in, in their lifetimes, which is good. All right, I think that's enough for section 101. Let's go check out some more historic sites or graves or whatever you can call them. Okay, guys, we were driving up. I believe Charles Kettering is buried in this mausoleum right here, but um, we were driving up and we saw this here. Now, the cool thing about this cemetery, I don't know anything about this person, but he's he has a um, for sure, so we're gonna check it out. Let's see what this guy has to offer. This is Johnny Morehouse. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there's this YouTuber called Wit Doc Cemetery Tours. Highly gonna recommend check him out. He did, if you love cemetery videos, check him out. Uh, I believe this grave here was in his intro for a while. I don't think it is anymore, but it used to be back in like 2021. Um, but the boy and dog, Johnny Morehouse, that's what they were called, the boy and dog. There are more than 100,000 of Dayton's finest citizens buried at Woodland Cemetery, but no tombstone or monument commands as much respect and attention as the boy and dog. For a visitor attraction, perhaps the boy and dog has caused more tears and aroused more interest 
than any other in the cemetery. Maybe I should play some like sad music in the background. Just, just show it. I don't, I'll see if it. The story tells of Johnny Morehouse, who lived at the SW corner of East 3rd and June Streets. The youngest son of a local cobbler whose shop was located along the Dayton Canal. I don't want to be in it. I want your audio. It's really windy. Along the Dayton Canal. I'll just restart. The story tells of Johnny Morehouse, who lived at the SW corner of East 3rd and June Streets. The youngest son of a local cobbler whose shop was located along the Dayton Canal. The old canal ran through the center of the city and is now Patterson Boulevard. As most children did, Johnny would play along the canal with his constant companion, his dog. One day while playing, Johnny fell into the canal. His beloved friend pulled him from the water, but unfortunately, Johnny had already drowned. Legend has it that several days after the burial, the dog appeared next to the boy's grave, staying by it morning, noon, and night. The monument, faithful in detail, shows Johnny's top, his ball, his mouth harp, and his little cap. These items were found in Johnny's pocket when he drowned. On the base of the monument, there are no dates, just the inscription, Slumber Sweet. The marble monument stands above five feet tall and was carved by local sculptor Daniel Ladau. It shows the dog watching over his sleepy master as he rests his head against his pet. Visitors of Johnny's grave tend to leave mementos decorating his monument. These items are being removed to avoid further deterioration of the marble. So this is Johnny Morehouse. So apparently he was a little child at the how old was he? he? Didn't say, but he was a child. Um, fell and drowned in the Dayton Canal. It was one of the most prominent graves in Woodland Cemetery. So these items were found in his pocket when he drowned. So seeing that there's, dang, he had a lot of toys in his pocket. He had a snake. That's not part of. Was. These are part of what was in his pocket. What's these are people just left toys for him. Oh, uh, those are people. These are actually what's in his pocket. Those people just left toys. Sorry. Just left toys for him. So I don't know how long ago this was. I'll, have to, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll put a date down right now on the, in the bottom corner of the screen or whatever when this happened and how old he was because I don't really know right now. All right. All right. Let's go check out Kettering's grave now. Okay. So this is the burial site of... Charles Kettering. Now, a lot of you guys probably heard of Kettering. What do you invent? The electrical engine? Ignition. Ignition. Electrical, electric ignition system. Yeah. Charles Kettering is famous for inventing the electric ignition system on a car engine. Um, so we'll, we'll get more into him as we get in here. But he's supposedly buried inside the mausoleum. This is the first time I've ever done an inside burial. Hopefully, they'll let us in with, a, with filming. Sometimes indoor places don't like filming. This one might. I usually don't film inside if you. Uh, yeah. oh, they're open. 365 days a year. Maybe it's because we're doing the repair. It's not. I, we'll just slide into this part. The door is locked and you probably need to get a key, but there, he's buried somewhere in there. This, These are the indoor burials. They're doing a repair here at Woodland Cemetery, which is probably why can't come in but these are what mausoleums look like i guess their casket is buried in that square which is really weird i would not want to be buried right there uh but there there it is those are the newer stuff as you can see well not necessarily well yeah pretty new 1990s 2000s 2012 this is a newer type of burial mausoleums uh a lot of the famous actors and actresses in hollywood are buried in mausoleums uh, which if i ever get out there i'll show you but for now, there's the mausoleum. And Kettering died in the 1950s. So it's probably on the other side there. It's probably that. Now let's go check out the next grip. Okay, so I was driving through here and I said, uh, just kidding. I was driving through here uh, to go see the next grave. Uh, and I saw this, they had a civil war 
mine, uh, memorial place here in Dayton and the Woodland Cemetery. They had a cannon here. Uh, these guns are trophies of the war for the Union erected in honor of the fallen comrades. So this is a cannon from the Civil War. Here we go. These are just all military people in general. This is a whole veteran section for them. So you have all the flags here. You can't really read them. This is not too windy. Here are all of uh, the Revolutionary War soldiers and patriots buried in unmarked graves in Montgomery County. Here they all are. These are all the um, revolutionary. This, that's Montgomery County in general. So here's another can. Let's check out some of these. In memory of the soldiers and sailors of the War of 1861 to 65. Here we go. Here are all these guys. Let's read out some of these here. These are just some normal lines. Here we go. Father Arthur Lindsay died January 26, 1887, at age 55. So they actually got him a different grave. For Lindsay. These are all Civil War graves. All these do. It shows you their branch, and then it'll tell them what regiment they were in during the Civil War. A lot of these guys probably lived after, though, after the Civil War. Uh, generally speaking, because a lot of ones that died in battle were probably buried at that battlefield. So these are um, solid died. Oh, they're buried here. Probably lived after the war. But there could be a few that died during the war. I mean, I don't know. Uh, there you go. This is beautiful. This one actually is a sign. Charles Goodwin Bickham. He was the he was a Medal of Honor recipient for his work and duties in the Philippine War. Now, that's a war nobody talks about. Let me get into it here. Captain Charles Goodwin Bickham. He was a captain in the U.S. Army during uh, the Philippine Insurrection, also known as the Philippine-American War. Philippine -American War. He was born August 12, 1867, died the 14th of December, 1944. Now, before we get into Charles Bickham, we're going to just talk about the Philippine War. Now, I usually don't go into the big part of wars when we have someone that served in a war, but... Most people probably don't know what the Philippine War was, okay? It was, a, it was a war fought between the United States and the Philippines. Basically, in 1898, during the Spanish-American War, the United States annexed a ton of land out in the ocean, including the Philippines. Philippines, Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, Hawaii, all those territories. The Philippines was one of the territories the United States annexed when we got greedy. And in 1899, the Philippines declared independence against the United States. But the United States refused to actually acknowledge the Philippines' independence. And in 1899, war broke out against the two countries. It lasted until July 2nd, 1902, which I'm filming this on July 1st, 2022, which is 120 years tomorrow. 120 years ago tomorrow. July 2nd, 1902 is when it ended. Charles Goodwin Bickham was a captain during the Philippine War. It was at the Battle of, I don't remember the battle put on screen. He was at that battle. I don't know much about the Philippine War. Uh, it was also known as the Philippine Insurrection, uh, kind of how uh, the Iraq War uh, was also called Operation Iraqi Freedom. There was another name for it. This was called the Philippine Insurrection, but nowadays we know it as the Philippine American War. Um, it was in 1899 to 1902. And he was gif gifted the Medal of Honor in 1901, I think, uh, for his duties as a leader captain during that war. Now, I decided just to check his grave out, not because of his military duties, just because nobody knows about the Philippine War, and I really wanted to talk about it because no, nope, many people know about it, and maybe you learned about it. Let me know in the comments below uh, if you've ever heard of the Philippine War, if you have anything to say about it, because most people have not heard about it. But here's his actual headstone, and that is his plaque there for his, his duties. Charles Bickham. All right. Now, he actually died during World War II, but he wasn't fighting in World War II, considering that he was in his 70s. But uh, we're going to check out this grave over here. This, I thought, was cool. This was not originally planned. A lot of stuff here is not originally planned. So, 
So, um, this is actually not too far from, um, Dunbar and the Wright Brothers graves right over here. The Wright Brothers and, and uh, Dunbar are buried over there. But we should have probably done. Look, you can see the Wright Brothers grave right from here. And I didn't even see it earlier. I didn't. I just completely skipped over these. Um, here we go. As you can see, there's a railroad guy. This guy is John Alexander Collins. He was he was born in Stamfordshire, England, uh, on June eighth of eighteen fifteen. Right at the end of the reign of George the third. He came to the United States in 1825 when he was 10 years old. He was a locomotive engineer and moved to Ohio in 1851 to open the CH and D Railroad, the CH and D Railroad. Remained with the road until 1872. And he died in Covington, Kentucky on January 26, 1878. Look how tall this is. Obviously, he was probably owned that company till his death. A lot of those uh, successful company owners get big graves like this. But I like that, that train uh, imprint there. That's really, really nice. All right. Only a few more graves today. We'll get into them right now. Here is the last famous grave we're visiting today. The grave of none other than Frank Stewart Patterson. Frank Stewart Patterson is one of the namesakes of the Wright, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, which is here in Dayton, Ohio. Obviously, Patterson after this guy and Wright after the Wright brothers. Uh, Dayton is a huge place in aviation. Patterson here um, was, I think he knew the Wright brothers and he was one of the first aviators in American history. He uh, served during World War I as a first lieutenant. <coughs> first lieutenant in 1917 when the United States got involved in World War I. Came back to Dayton in 1918 at the Air Force Base where they where he was, and he was uh, give, he was the guy who tested all the new planes, and he was on doing a test flight um, in 1918 on one of the newer planes, and actually got in a plane crash and was killed in 1918, becoming one of the first people to ever die in a plane crash. I think it was after World War One. So, that was his story. Let's just check out the burial site. So here's the actual grave in here. Well, these are all the Pattersons. Um, his father or his son was actually another Patterson. It's buried somewhere. Another Patterson, but he's the namesake of the Wright Patterson Airport Air Force Base, which is here in Dayton. You ever hear about Wright Pat? Now this is the path and the right is the right row. This is a pretty sweet area. Here are the commemorated Colonel Robert Patterson, Pioneer American, and his descendants who occupy this resting place. Colonel Patterson was of that hardy frontier race who won the West for the United States. He moved to Dayton from Kentucky in 1804. He was one of the early Pattersons then. Uh, died at nearby Rubicon Farm in 1827, the first of his name and family to be buried here. His descendants did their part in preserving the foundations which uh, he helped to lay and in the building worth, worthily uh, there, thereupon. Uh, the, they labored and fought to save the union which his generation won. In the, in the, in, in, in the industrial era, which ensued. They assumed that uh, notable leadership which their pioneer ancestors supplied in earlier times. Here are gathered in all men and women of the family loyalty, personal industry, and public spirit which has maintained the American, uh, which has maintained the America of the pioneer effort and hope. Here are all the Pattersons buried. Dang, check that out. So here's all the names here, and then this is how they are related. That's freaking awesome. And here's the lifespans, so going all the way down to 2003. Those are all the Pattersons. And one of the Pattersons is the guy that was killed in the plane crash. Name's taking right, Patterson Air Force. Air Force in the base. Okay, so now that we did that beautiful cemetery, I'm gonna rest here for a little bit and then we're gonna go check out 
since this cemetery was so cool, we're gonna go check out, end it off with checking out the person who designed the thing. Van work. Here we go. We're ending off with the last grave today is none other than the person that designed this cemetery because they did a great job. Uh, it is John W. Van Cleve was his name. He's probably Dutch. June 27, 1801 to September 6, 1858. He's up here. He designed it in 1841. But I'm going to give him a complete recognition because this place is absolutely amazing. One of the cooler cemeteries, coolest cemeteries I've ever been to. I've been to a lot, so I'm not going to say it's the coolest I've ever been to, but it's awesome. And here is some of his family here. Mary Van Cleve, his mother, 1792. Maybe his wife, uh, 1792, 1825. Benjamin Moore, Van Cleve, 1774, 1773, 1821, 1782 to 1810. This guy designed the place, the Woodland Cemetery. No, they got this here, but he designed this place, so we're gonna get what we have done today. Thank Van Cleve for that. Japanese person. So well designed. So well designed. Hey, they died February 7, 2020. For a long time fans, that was the day I posted the uh, Smash uh, Ultimate uh, Fighter Pass 2 predictions. Patterson's buried. Well, we might be able to see Patterson's grave from the top. It's buried on the other side of this. There's Dayton, Ohio. This is where the this is where we are here. That's what the city looks like if you've ever been to Dayton. Uh, it's 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 a large one of the bigger cities in Ohio, but it's not uh, that big. But it's it's a good size. It was founded originally in 18 uh, 1796. It was originally founded. The cemetery was put here in 1841. So. Uh, that it's gonna be it for the video so uh thanks for watching let me know which grave is your favorite and i'll see you guys next time goodbye Wah!